Morning, everybody. If you, uh, morning, morning. If you're in the lounge or in the foyer, please make your way into the auditorium. We're going to be starting soon. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Hope you're all well, all safe, and welcome to those joining us online. Good to have you with us as well. We're going to start off with some announcements, and then we're going to have worship. Uh, we're going to be streaming the worship as well, which is uh, exciting uh, for those joining us and haven't joined us for a while. We're going to be streaming worship, and then we'll have the sermon after that. So we're just going to start with some announcements. Um, we'd like to welcome any guests here with us. Good to have you with us. We've got a chocolate for you uh, to say thanks for joining us. So someone will be getting that to you just now. I think Casper will be doing that. There will be no coffee shop opening after the service, unfortunately. There will be no children's ministry as well for the holidays. Children will remain in the service with us. Um, there are some craft packs available in case there are any kids that want to do crafts during church. Uh, in case, you know, I'm very boring in what I, s uh, what I speak today, you girls can go and do some, some, uh, some crafts. I think it's just my two daughters here at this stage, so uh, they'll be in trouble if they leave. And then just a reminder, if you are praying for someone, please keep your masks on and stay socially distant from each other. And we are going to take up an offering for mercy so as worship starts, I'd like the worship team to come up. Uh, as we start with worship, you guys can please just make your way down and put something, whatever the Lord lays on your heart, into the baskets. The baskets are open. So uh, thanks so much. We'll just um, get the worship team up, and uh, we're going to just pray and um, invite the Lord just to be here. Where two or more gather, there he is in our midst. So even though we, we thin on the ground here, um, we know he's, he's in our midst when we glorify him and when we invite him in. So Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for each other, the church. Thank you for the fellowship that we can have. Thank you that you're not restricted by masks or social distance. Lord, you can move in any way. We think of you, Jesus, just giving the word. You just spoke a word and someone was healed and someone was delivered. Someone was set free. So we thank you for your presence here. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Would you come and minister to every one of our hearts today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just then. Now, Lord, I ask that you open up our hearts this morning. Come and do what you want to do, Lord. Meet us here this morning. Tonight, the sky is heavy, 
It feels like the winds, yeah, they're gonna change beneath my feet. The earth is ready, and I know it's time for heaven's rain. Looks up, it looks like tonight. The sky is heavy, it feels like the winds are gonna change. And beneath my feet, the earth is ready, and I know it's time for heaven's rain. Yeah, it's gonna rain. Looks like tonight the sky is heavy. It feels like the winds, yeah, they're gonna change. Then it my feet, the earth is ready, and I know it's time for heaven's rain. Living water we desire To flood our hearts with holy fire To rain down All around the world we're singing Rain down Can you hear the earth they're singing Rain down My heart is dry, the bells still sing This barren land, cause it's living, cause it's living water we desire to flood our hearts with oil.
sing louder We let this place erupt with grace Can you hear it? The sound of heaven touching
floodgates of heaven. And let it rain. We know your glory, your power, your miracles in greater depths and greater volumes. Would you pour out over our lives, Lord? I pray for an expectancy in every one of our hearts, Lord. be expected. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, youth band. This is the youth band. This is the youth band. Well done, guys. So if you want to hear these guys again, come to youth on a Friday night, because this is our youth band. How cool is that? Thank you. Jono's parents, welcome. Good to have you, Andre and Barbara, and the sisters at Caitlin. Eh? Caitlin, welcome. How's Jono doing on the drums? Good. Hey, is it, no, not yet. Eh? I think he's improved quite a bit, but uh, you'll know better than me. So uh, that's great. Good to have you here. All the way from Zim. And welcome to everyone else. Good to have you here. Welcome to our visitors. So we get, we're continuing on our theme of fellowship, and uh, I think this is the fourth time I'm speaking on fellowship, and uh, I'm really excited about it, really excited to share the word. Let's, can we read Acts 2? This is a scripture many have used uh, from verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So this is the early church. This is just after Pentecost had happened. The Holy Spirit had been poured out. The church was birthed. And this is what it looked like. This is what the church looked like. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together, together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Imagine a church like that. Imagine us looking like that. And this was not a prescribed way of doing church. Jesus didn't give the 10 rules of church, the 10 commandments of gathering. Uh, This was completely organic. This was completely authentic. This is what happened when the Spirit came upon them. This is what the Spirit did in each individual. I love the way the um, Spirit-filled Bible says it. Uh, It says sharing um, that word fellowship, koinonia, means Sharing unity, close association, partnership, participation, a society, a communion, a fellowship, contributory help, the brotherhood. And it says, then it goes on, it says, it's a unity brought about by the Holy Spirit. In Cornonia, the individual shares in common an intimate bond of fellowship with the rest of the Christian society. Quinonia cements the believers to the Lord Jesus and to each other. Isn't that wonderful? So this is the work of the Holy Spirit in each individual's lives, working in each other. So it's not, it's not a commandment. It's not a rule keeping. It's completely organic. It's the Holy Spirit working in me, and so I begin to reach others and work with others. Jesus was our example, but he's also our power. He doesn't He's not just our example to model our lives after, but he empowers us as well to do that. And it says that Jesus was um, God anointed, Acts 10, 38. God anointed, I don't know if I gave you that one, uh, Danny. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Jesus modeled intimacy with the Father. 
Jesus was not just a moral code or a new philosophy. He healed people. He delivered people. He accepted people. He loved people. And he asks us to do the same. And he doesn't just ask us. He empowers us to to love and accept and, and heal and reach out and deliver. In John 14, 12, Jesus said this, I'll tell you the truth. Anyone, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So Jesus empowers us to be able to do these very things that he did. Jesus shared his life with others. And I think that's what I really want to bring home today. Jesus shared a life. He wasn't a monk up in a mountain. And with all respect to monks, we've had some incredible teachings and some credible wisdom. And God calls some people to a life like that. So I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying Jesus wasn't like that. He did life. He did daily life with people. He faced rejection. He faced persecution. He faced jeering. He faced acceptance. He faced people trying to even make him look great and make his name look great. He, there were people that wanted to make him king. They wanted a conquering king. He, he faced all sorts of trials every single day that he walked. He was not isolated and removed from the reality of the world. He drew on strength from the Father. He shared intimate moments and time in prayer, drawing on strength from, from the Father. But he also drew on strength from his disciples. And I realized this for the first time this week. Jesus actually drew on those around him as well, which is, which is critical. If Jesus needed it, so do we. We need to draw on each other. We need to be there for each other. Because look at this. When Jesus is about to be betrayed in Gethsemane, he went to a place and he took his trusted disciples with him, the same ones that he had taken um, onto the Mount of Transfiguration. And he said, sit here while I go and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. This was such a crucial moment in Jesus' life. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him the next day. And, and then, so he leaves the disciples. They, they don't, still don't understand the magnitude of what's going to happen to Jesus. And so he says, guys, wait here, pray with me, stand with me. I'm, I'm sorrowful, I'm deeply distressed. And then verse 38, he comes back. Uh, no, he doesn't come back. That verse, uh, he says, then he said to them, my soul is consumed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he comes back and he finds them sleeping. But I found that place, Jesus is, is needing others. And he's relying on them to stand with him and pray with him. And uh, he wanted to draw on their strength as well. I remember um, I was brought up in the Ramakrishna movement, which is a sect of Hinduism. My parents used to go to what they call the ashram. And um, it was, uh, it was this, this, this sort of temple with this compound and this community thing. And, and the guru, who's like the priest, uh, he sits there in his chair um, and when you arrive, you bow down to him and you go and you press his feet and you bow down at his feet. And he sits there and everyone serves him. Everyone runs around him like he's the king. He's the king of the ashram. And everyone runs around him and serves him and bows down to him like he's some sort of mini god. And I thought about Jesus. You know, Jesus did quite the opposite. He actually and went down on his knees and he washed the disciples' feet. And he served. He served people. He gave everything. He even gave his own life. I can't imagine that guru giving his life for his devotees. You know, if the pawpaw hits the fan and they're surrounded, uh, he'll be the first one out of there in my mind. He's not going to give his life for his devotees. And yet Jesus was prepared to, the, to do that. And it's just such a a picture of the difference that Jesus done, does in our lives. We're not these kings that just expect to be served and just sit around and wait for everyone um, to serve us. Uh, I'm part of a swimming group, which Vota and Simon's on and a couple of other guys. And the one guy posted something this week. He said, if serving is below you, then leadership is above you. 
Um, and it's so true. How and and Gav and I and a couple of the uh, pastors and Dave and um, we've, been, we've been watching some of the GLS um, that happened this year, Global Leadership Summit at uh, Willow Creek Church, and it's amazing. Uh, these are not just Christian leaders, pastors, but industry leaders as well, talking about the importance of serving, that CEOs and leaders of companies need to serve uh, and be vulnerable and transparent. So they're right, Gab. All right, so I wanted to give us four key benefits that fellowship does for us. Um, and who knows, when you're sick, what do you take? You take meds, short for medicine. You take M-E-D-S. And I'm going to give us just four things that I found, that I feel um, are important for us. They, they benefits we, we derive and others derive out of being in fellowship. And remember, fellowship is not just about my comfort. It's, it's, about, it's about others as well. You know, we gather not just because it suits us, but because we know others need us. So first one I'm going to start with, the M, is meaning. Fellowship brings meaning in our lives. And Romans 12 from verse 4 says this, in this way, we are, for each of us, just as, for, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to, the, to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. No, your Romans 12, 6. So that's meaning. The meaning comes um, from the body. This is how the message says it. In the same way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. So I get my meaning from, from you. You don't get your meaning. You do get your meaning from me, but I'm not the meaning. I get my meaning from what I'm part of. For, so, for example, let's say one of your family members works for Google, one of the biggest, most recognized, well-known companies in the world. Do you think they're going to be ashamed of saying, I work for Google? You know, or, or would, they be, would there be some sort of meaning in their lives that they work for Google? You know, I'm a Google employee. I'm one of the top whatever you know, percentage in the world in terms of my EQ and IQ that they selected me. I'm not saying going around boasting, but there's a tremendous meaning that comes from that. Meaning of belonging to a certain church. I remember... My first job as a pastor, we would have to go and visit people, the, the new, all the new visitors. We'd have to go and haste go and see them. And so many of them said to me, uh, it feels like your church is run like a business. Because um, there was such an emphasis on money. And I said, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> but in my heart, I knew. You know? And so there was something the, that, that diminished the meaning by them having this perception that this particular church that I was a pastor at was run like a business. In other words, we're more interested in your money than we are about you. And so that doesn't have good meaning. That doesn't bring good meaning as you as a representative of them. So we get our meaning by what we're part of, which is each other, the body, the body of Christ. If you're struggling with your own sense of meaning and value, then consider what you're part of. Jesus has chosen you and I to be part of his very own body. And we're not talking just about fountain. We're talking about the, the church worldwide. We are part of the church. I'm part of you and therefore have meaning. We, we moved recently, as some will know, and um, we were doing some, some last-minute checks, cupboards, cleaning, wiping, making sure everything was clean, and I found a little miserable pu puzzle piece in one of my daughter's cupboards. And it was in dust, and there was some, still some cobwebs and other bits of stuff left there. And I just wanted, I, I was going to just take this little piece of puzzle and chuck it in a box with trash. And then I thought to myself, no, maybe I should keep this little piece of puzzle because if my daughter's ever put that particular puzzle together again and there's a piece missing, it's going to look a bit odd. 
It's going to look incomplete. Um, and likewise, you and I, we are each a little part of a puzzle that on its own, you may think has no value or no meaning. But when you place it in a thousand piece or 500 piece or 100 piece puzzle, whatever they make, there's tremendous meaning in that because it's part of a, of a greater whole. So that's my first one, meaning. We get meaning from each other. Even in uh, Acts 5.41, can we put that one up, Danny? Um, the, these disciples were, were, were arrested for, for preaching. They were, they were flogged. They were put in jail. They were uh, and then released. And they, they found tremendous joy in being part of Jesus' body. They, when they actually, they, they considered it great joy to have suffered for his name. You know, that they, could, that they could be flogged and beaten just because they represented Jesus. Don't worry, Danny, if you, if you haven't got it there. Um, but there was, their, their meaning came from that. They could endure, um, yeah, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. They felt that this was worth, this was a body worth living for and dying for. So there was tremendous meaning for the early church. Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and I haven't read the book, but I've, I've read some parts of the book. And, and this is something he says, is that meaning comes from others. It's not just about you having everything you want. In fact, he's saying the more that you look outside of yourself, the more that you look to help others, the more meaning you derive in your life. And I found that quite interesting. Dr. Leaf, Caroline Leaf, I've mentioned her many times. Uh, I love what she studies the brain and the mind-brain correlation, how, how thinking affects our brain. And she says this, often when we feel depressed, down, discouraged, we isolate ourselves. And she's saying that we should actually not do that because isolation and loneliness can make the physical and mental side effects of depression or anxiety or anything else unbearable and can even lead to suicide. So if you are struggling or if you know someone who is struggling, reach out. Even if you just end up having a good cry while someone holds your hand and gives you a hug. It may be uncomfortable at first, especially as this requires degrees of vulnerability, but the healing power of community can work wonders. So we're talking about meaning, we're talking about community, but the healing power of community can work wonders, she says. And some of the advice she gives, um, quite a bit, but I'm just going to give one or two. Uh, she's saying, be present. If you're listening to someone, if someone's going through a hard time, just be present. Switch your phone off or put it on silent and just be present. Just listen to them. Engage. You don't have to give any advice sometimes. People just want to talk. People just want to offload. So the power of community, trying to do it on your own, can be a huge mistake. The next one from meds is encouragement. M-E, encouragement. The Bible says in Hebrews 3, verse 13, encourage one another daily. As long as, it is all, is, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What I love about that word encouragement is that in there is the word courage. So that when I encourage you, I'm giving you courage. You know, Steve, I just want to say you're such an encourager. Steve Pedersen, you're such an encourager. You might not think so, but how many times Steve's come up to me and just a simple thing like, Josh, you're doing a great job. Um, just puts a bit of wind in my sails. You know, it doesn't have to be deep or anything extravagant, guys, but let's encourage one another. Let's encourage one. Let's encourage our band when the guys are here. Well done. Well done. You, you're growing. You, something's happening in your life. You don't know what people are going through because you can't see what's going on in the inside of someone else. So giving an encouraging word to someone can do something phenomenal. And I want to say thanks to Yanni Boerte over there, because Yanni gave me this one on Monday night when we had our rites of passage dinner. I, I, I mentioned to him what I was going to be preaching on, and he says, Jeremy Riddle said this, encouragement is like oxygen to the human spirit. 
Don't forget, you carrying someone else's air. Encourage them. Help them to breathe. Isn't that wonderful? Can I say it again? Encouragement is like oxygen to the human spirit. Don't forget, you carrying someone else's air. Encourage them. Help them to breathe. So if you can try once a day, just encourage somebody, please. I remember doing comrades, the comrades marathon. They call it the greatest human race, almost 90 kilometers from Durban to Peter Marisburg. And if any of you have ever driven that road, it's a long way to drive, never mind run. But there are thousands and thousands of people that line the streets to encourage people they don't even know. And they'll look out for the one person they do know. But for me, the, the feeling of running and getting Literally thousands of people lining the road, encouraging you, clapping you, cheering you on, saying, come on, you can do it. You're nearly there. All sorts of words of encouragement that, that just blow wind into your sails, give you courage to take a, do another kilometer, you know? And it really is a tough race for those who have done it. It's a tremendously mental race. Physically, you're broken. But mentally, the, 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 the toll, it's incredibly... You're doing a mar- you do a marathon... And you still got another marathon, plus a little bit, plus a park run. You know, it's, you know, so you get to your marathon, 42 Ks. I've still got a park run, plus another marathon, and I'm already tired. So the tremendous courage. Uh, I think it's one of the most amazing. Same with Iron Man. I mean, Iron Man, the same, the way thousands of people just line the streets and just encourage people. That's what encouragement is. Someone said this, a word of encouragement during a failure is worth more than an hour of praise after success. I remember Richard Prentice saying he had a girl, he's, they've got a rehab center, there's a girl that came in that had been cutting herself, self-harm, abusing her own body because she felt worthless and useless and he said to her, you're beautiful. And she'd been craving that from her own parents. She'd wished her parents would just tell her she's beautiful. But obviously because they never told her, she was ugly. So this, this girl's worth harming, you know? And so it's so important that we encourage people. I remember once um, we were doing an, a, an outreach on the Durban beachfront. Um, and we had a, a, like this music gang and there was a whole lot of us youngsters, youth age, just reaching out to anyone who would listen. And one guy came past and I just reached out to him and, and just shared the gospel and it was, it was night time, it was getting dark, and he said to me, I was just about to go and jump off the end of the pier and end my life. And there was such a wake-up call for me, and that here I was, I had the opportunity to encourage someone and save their life, you know? Um, and, and we've heard other stories about that, but that was something that was very real to me, that happened to me, where he confessed to me, Josh, I was, I was going to go and end it now. I was walking to the end of the pier. I was just going to jump off the end. He had lost all hope. I remember when Bernice and I were trying to have, a, have our first baby. We were really struggling. Uh, and we were part of a house church that every week would pray for us and encourage us and declare and speak and say, you guys are going to fall pregnant. You guys are going to do this thing. Give us even little faith gifts. And um, There's tremendous encouragement that comes from one another. So try and put that in. Remember meds. This week, meds. Even when it doesn't suit you, you get meaning from someone else. When it doesn't suit you, encourage someone. Even if you're having a bad day yourself, encourage someone. And then D, devotion. Devotion, we read that scripture from Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and they devoted themselves to gathering together. They devoted themselves. Devotion is more than friendship. Devotion is love, loyalty, enthusiasm for a person or an activity. And we know any meaningful relationship takes time. It doesn't just happen overnight. You know, you grow deeper by spending time together. So that's how we grow in our, in our friendships and our devotion with each other, by spending time together. Romans 12, 10 says this, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Someone once said, loyalty is not a word, it's a lifestyle. Jesus devoted to us. 
He's completely devoted to us. Romans 8. I haven't put this up because I, I love it from the message. It says, who or what can separate us from his love? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for you now. Jesus is praying for us. He's standing in the gap for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or coronavirus? Who can separate us from Jesus' love? He's completely devoted to us. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So even when we're feeling unfaithful, he's still faithful. Even when I'm having a bad day, he's still faithful. Lamentations 3.22, we are still alive because of the Lord's faithful love. Because the Lord's faithful love never ends. Every morning he shows it in new ways. You are so very true and loyal. I say to myself, the Lord is my God and I trust him. Devotion. John 13, 34 to 35, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Everyone will know that you are my disciples because of your love for each other. Devotion. Meds. Meaning. Encouragement. Devotion. And finally, S for service. We serve and we be served. And I believe we, we, we get served by, and I, and I gave that illustration of the guru earlier on, who just served, you just wanted to be served. But I believe that as we serve, so we get served back. There's almost this reciprocal thing that happens. Because fellowship isn't a restaurant where I sit down at a table and I order my food and they bring it and I shout if it's not the way I want it to be, or I complain if it's the portion's too small. So coming together and gathering is not a restaurant. We don't come sit here and just say, well, I'm just here to be served. I'm just here to get a message. I'm just here to sing a few songs. We actually come with the attitude of serving one another. How can I encourage somebody else? How can I be a gift to you? And in that way, we become a gift to someone else. We, the gift comes back. It's almost like, because Proverbs says, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So when I refresh you, I get refreshed. You're getting refreshed, but by me refreshing you, I'm getting refreshed myself. It's almost like the, the, the dam, you know, the dam analogy. The water's running in, the water's running out. But there's always this fresh water coming in and pure water or good water coming in. So, so as we become this conduit, this flow, we, be, we become more alive. So we, even though I might come with the idea this morning of serving you, you know, I, someone's going to serve me. In, her, in house church, someone's going to give me a word. Someone's going to encourage me. I don't come just to sit and say, okay, well, someone must bless me today. Someone must give me a word. No, if I come with the attitude I'm going to serve, someone else might serve me by giving me a word, a prophetic word, a, a prayer, that something special that happens. So as soon as we look outside of ourselves, everyone, just that's what I'm encouraging us to do and those watching, look outside yourselves. Look at others and think, how can I serve? How can I bless you? How can I encourage you? How can I bring more meaning to your life? How can I be more devoted to you? And so Galatians 5.13 says, and I'm, this is my last one, so we'll be finished in a few minutes. Beloved ones, God has called us to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit. Freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another, expressing love in all we do. Isn't that amazing? There's freedom that comes by serving one another. Hebrews 6.10, for God, this is from the Passion Translation, for God, the faithful one, is not unfair. How can he forget the work you have done for him? 
He remembers the love you demonstrate as you continually serve his beloved ones for the glory of his name. Wow. God doesn't forget when you do a kind deed for someone else, one of your brothers and sisters who are, happen to be his sons and daughters. We are in the company of sons and daughters of the king. Isn't that amazing? I serve you. I'm blessing one of God's, the king's sons or daughters. Philippians 2, 1 to 4. Well, I'll give you that one, Danny. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. The message says it like this, agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put, a, put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Isn't that a beautiful way of saying it? I'm going to end there. Meds, meaning, encouragement, devotion, and serving. Serving means serving each other, but in this, and hopefully someone else gets to serve us, but that's not our motivation. Can we stand together? Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for each other. Thank you for this amazing body. Thank you for those that are online watching and sharing. We pray for them, Lord, those online. You'd help them to be in a position to, to meet again, especially those with comorbidities, those that are struggling with health issues, Lord, those that are self-isolating and just tuning in. We pray for them. We pray for their souls, Lord, as they, there may be loneliness, Lord, or isolation and a yearning and a desire to gather again. We pray that you'd encourage them right now. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would be their encouragement. All those, Lord, that are online, those that are alone, those that feel, those that are old, don't have family around, those that are, are stuck in, in places where they can't leave, Lord, we pray for them. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would do what no man can do and reach them. We pray for each other that are here now. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to reach each other. Help us to serve, Lord. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to be there for one another. We thank you for community. We thank you for the benefits of community. That as we look to serve others, as we look to refresh others, so you refresh others. You refresh us. And so there becomes this continual feeling of us serving and you serving us, Lord. And you keep just topping us up and keep filling us up. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege of being part of the church. Thank you for the privilege of being in your body, of being called a son and a daughter of the King. I pray, Lord, for those that struggle to encourage others, Lord. Those that feel they don't have anything to offer. Those that feel that they don't have any value in themselves. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, you'd show them the value of who they are. Just feel that right now. If, you, if you're struggling with seeing your own value, if you if you feeling... I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give. I am useless, worthless. I just want to let you know that you are so valuable, that Jesus is so devoted to you, that you were worth dying for, 
that while you weren't looking for Jesus, he came looking for you. So I just pray, Lord, you encourage them right now. Holy Spirit, would you just minister to each one of us? Pray for your presence. I just want to give each one of you an opportunity just to pray. Just quietly pray. This message has touched you in any way. If you want to realign your thinking, think of someone maybe that, that the Lord brings to mind that you want to encourage or reach out to. I'm just going to give us each a minute or two of quiet. And just focus on him and just pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. If anybody needs prayer, you're wel welcome to come up. We'll pray for you. We hope you have a fantastic Sunday. Just a reminder, there's no evening services until next year. I think it's the 10th. We open up 10th of January will be our first evening service. Encourage somebody today. And the Christmas service is at 9 o'clock. Kids, welcome. We're going to have a child-friendly message and an adult-friendly message. I'm going to do the child-friendly message. Gav's going to do the, the, the adult-friendly message. And it'll be 59 minutes, the service, okay, on Christmas Day. So no more than an hour. 9 o'clock, Christmas Day. And then Gav's preaching next Sunday morning. Thanks, everyone. Bless you all.